Good day, Thomas Jefferson, our podcast listeners. And thank you for listening. And if you missed it last week, we are so pleased to announce the Jefferson Hour hotline. The number is 701-575-0727. And by hotline, we mean you can order CDs and so on there. But mostly, you can leave your listener question or comment, make it brief, speak clearly. But if you want to have a question on this program... We'll try to air some of them, and instead of you reading people's questions yes, it's all from a great, email, it'll be in their own voice. It's a great plot to sort of remove me even further. Oh, my. No, no, <laughs> sir, no. But 701-575-0727. We want to hear the questions. 701 I hope you flood us. Uh, yeah, we want questions. to hear the questions in, in your voices. We really do. We would do the program live look, look, if look we could, forward. but yeah, we can't. But, can't but at least we can have your recorded questions and comments, but try to make them brief because anything longer than about 35 or 40 seconds is just probably not going to get on the air. I also wanted to say, we talked last week about the uh, the Constitutional Crisis Show and this overwhelming response we got. Mostly positive, which uh, surprised uh, You know, me about half a dozen people wrote in and they said, where can I get a copy of this? How can I share it? How can I listen to it? And, um, of course, we responded to most of them, but... If you are wanting to hear Clay's essay, go to jeffersonhour.com. We're really proud of the website. All the information about the website is there. You can listen to Clay's essays. I, I believe there's even text of them. I might be wrong on that, I but I believe right. there is. And um, if you're there, you can also support the show. And you can. We would appreciate that very much. We need it, and we like it, and it makes the program possible. As you like to say, it's a labor of love. We take no personal income from it, uh, but it does help us to expand our listenership and to develop our website and to offer Yeah, the website, the website is really uh, something. Options. People should go there. You know, it is something, and our webmaster is absolutely it puts Terrific. a lot of time in that, yeah. Yeah, so that's all important, and he has some other new prospects in the works for things we're going to do with the Jefferson Hour. And yeah. I'm going to, I should say, I'm going to Norfolk uh, next week to do a program at the Chrysler Museum. Oh, that's right, Jefferson right. And, and Andrea Palladio. Well, that may have happened by the time this airs, but and, uh, But then I'm going back there. in February okay. for this thing. It's a little bit absurd, but it's, I'm, it's, it's, it's called Clyde Jenkinson Without the Tights. <laughs> it's like I'm going to do comedy. And what advertising firm did you hire to come up with that title? I'm not saying, but I'm, <laughs> I'm going to do comedy. I'm going to tell stories, uh, stories of the humanities. <laughs> you know, I I know this sounds ridiculous, but I discovered a number of years ago that I'm I can be funny. <laughs> yeah, see, you laughed. That was that was a it wasn't a, a real laugh, but still, thank you. But I discovered that I can make people laugh, and I love to make people laugh. It's yeah, my doesn't? happiest thing. Who doesn't? And That's I, great. I I can tell a joke in front of an auditorium of five hundred people, and I can make them laugh. It, it's like an involuntary thing that they do, and it's so satisfying. It's it's the single most satisfying thing that I get well, to do. That's great. And, and by the way, and it's in February. At the Roper Theater all of those, in Norfolk. All those dates, those performances, all the, on the cultural website. tours, everything's on the website. And, and uh, it, there was also somebody who wrote in wanting to know about a book you'd recommend. And I know there's book recommendations on the website. We try to get back to all the letters that come into us. But meanwhile, meanwhile, the important thing that we're supposed to be Dr. talking Joseph about Ellis. is what the show is about this week. And you... You called this one. You had five questions. I called it in because I'm, I'm preparing to do a, a Ken Burns interview for a film that he's right. working on. Right. Congratulations on that. It's so nerve-wracking. I don't even want to go into that because you think... he put. Does he still put a camera like eight inches from yeah, your face? Yeah, and then he says, and like, sits there who is Benjamin Franklin? You think, oh, da, ba, da, ba, da, famous ba, da. one light, half, right. half, meet he the Beatles look. He still uses film, yeah. and, you, and you're looking at his extraordinary visage, and uh -huh. he says, uh, tell me about Benjamin Franklin, and you think... Well, there was the thing with the kite, and you know there was uh, the Continental Congress, and so and you go next week. And I'm preparing, and so Wait, I, will you promise to give us a report when you oh, come I back? I will. I, yeah. I don't hang myself, but <laughs> but um, he says stick the landing, stick the landing. Yeah, but tell, you've tell worked, listeners you've what that me. means. It means when you're going to if you're going to do a soundbite, so ask me a question, any question. Well, it, we don't need to do that. Because no, I'm going to try to stick the landing. Give me uh, just one. What will you have for dinner tonight? I haven't decided yet, but I know that it's going to be something healthy and nutritious. 
Okay, now do it without sticking the landing. Well, I don't know what I'm going to have tonight, David, but I, 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 I've been thinking about maybe doing steak. But, you know, steak, you know, you can have so much red meat. But a thing that I really love is to have granola and a little bit. Well, but I don't, the okay, yogurt so, you can get in business. That's great. That's great. Now, as an editor, it just makes me cringe. You can't edit that last Because one. in order to edit, someone needs to end a sentence, period. You got you to gotta stop, uh-huh. take a little breath, and let the editor get you know, in and out. You know who does it well? Well, there are two. George Will, Uh world class. Excellent. And that's why he's in Ken Burns' films, one Uh of the reasons, because he does it. He knows what he's going to say coming in. He says it. No thinking noises, boom. And there's not this, oh, yeah, and another thing, and another thing. And another person who really does it well is H.W. Brands, the historian from the University of Texas at Austin. He's in a lot of Ken Burns' films, and he's outstanding. And the reason that he's outstanding is he's a very brilliant man. That he's and he's written a lot of books and he knows what he's talking about. All that goes without thinking, but he's able to present it in ways that can be used, and most people can't do it. And I have trouble with it. And so when I always listen, stick the landing, stick the landing. So you, you want to say what you know. You want to say everything you know. And it's hard to edit on but the they fly. They can't use that. Yeah, they can only use that which is a well. I hate to say it, a sound I'm, bite. I'm certain you will be great. And uh, uh, I don't know. So in the in the show, I but think I was don't preparing you, for it. Don't you and Ellis talk a little bit about how well, you got in trouble? Yeah, we, we 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 met on. Uh, in, well, in we, Ken it's Burns. in the show, but, you, but a couple but of so uh, schoolboys. I was preparing for this, uh-huh. and I I decided to go to the source to go to Joseph Ellis. And I read this first little introduction to the to his book American Creation, and I thought this is like a perfect show program because he said there were five contributions of the founding fathers to the permanent culture of America, and they're very interesting. And I, as I read them, I thought, uh oh, how are we doing? How are we doing? Uh, you know, is is the wall of separation between church and state still strong? Uh, we were the world's shining light, a city on a hill. Are we still? Does the world still look on us in that light? The dual sovereignty between nation and state, how's that holding up? And so I wanted to put all these things that he said were the founding fathers' contributions to the permanent settlement of American life and put them to him now because he's been doing a little later in life thinking about all these things. It was fodder for a interesting. great conversation. And he's so much fun because he's funny. I'm just in awe He's of that lighthearted. He, he, and it is, here I am getting to listen to these two historians exchange ideas. It's just great. Well, I, for me, it's just a thrill to be able to say the words Joseph Ellis. Uh-huh. He's won the Pulitzer Prize and the National you, Book Award. And you get some pretty high praise from that gentleman. I Well, you know, it, obviously he hasn't, hasn't met enough time with me, but uh, <laughs> but that's fine. I'll take it where I get it. And, and he's agreed to become uh, he's more a regular. He's gonna, he said he'd come on once every six weeks. He's retired so. from teaching and he misses he it. He misses the chance to hold to, to forth. Talk. Right, so, yeah. So, so yeah, and, and he's very circumspect. So, is, you know, with many pe- t- academics, they have a view. This is my view. Joe's like, well, I used to think this. I'm not so sure now. And I'm kind of, yeah, that's an interesting point. Let me think about that. So his mind is open. He's a senior citizen. Yes, but in the end, he's usually right. Of course. And, <laughs> and he's changed the way I think about the founding generation. And If you said, whose books would be a mistake not to have in this in this line of discourse, it would be Joseph Ellis. That's a great place to head to the show. Uh, one more time. 701-575-0727. 701-575-0727. Call in your questions and, and we, your comments. We really hope we we get to hear from you. And, and, and uh, we're still looking for uh, thoughtful, principled conservatives. We, we have a couple that we have to follow up with. And again, jeffersonhour.com. You can find Clay's essays. You can listen to the current shows, all sorts of stuff. And you can support the Jefferson Hour, which we really do need. And it's that time of year. And you know what? I'm writing a country western song. Oh, really? Because Chrysler said, you got to have talent. Yeah. No. I'm writing one. It's going to rock the world. I got to, and I want. I'm going to bring it in. We, I want Chrysler on the line. Let's go to the show. We and can then I want Chrysler to to make music out of it, and then I'll take the royalties. Say goodnight, friend. Yeah, good. Let's listen to the show. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson or one of our special guests who is here to join us in this program today. Clay, would you introduce him? Yes, one of my dearest friends and somebody whose work I so greatly admire, Joseph Ellis, back by popular demand. 
And I'll tell you, Joe, why I invited you in a moment here, but welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Hey, Clay, great to, great to be back, and welcome back from uh, Gay Paris and Part South and where you where you found the Jefferson spirit down there and speaking to us again. Um, at, but um, it's a pleasure to be talking to you. Well, I, I so appreciate that. I was for two and a half weeks on the Jefferson Trail in France, and, and you know, as, he, as you know from your work, he spent eight days on the Canal de Midi, the Canal de Languedoc in southern France. It was the first great canal in Europe, and it was one of the happiest times of his life. He also instructed the canal lock men on how to improve the mechanisms of their locks and make them more efficient. So that's that's sort of the Jefferson that you talk about in your book, American Sphinx, that this uh, sort of a, um, a gadgeteer, kind of a whimsical genius who was a little un- otherworldly. Well, that's also where a lot of his, his architectural uh, ideas and instincts found fruition in, in the, the kind of, that became the basis for the Monticellan style I have these art historian friends who keep telling me if Jefferson had kept going and gone over to Italy and gone into gone down to Rome, all of American architectural history would be different. It would look like the Pantheon. <laughs> That's right. And, well, he um, did the Pantheon with the rotunda at the university, but he, you know, he said he had a peep into Elysium. He got as far as Milan, but he didn't <laughs> dare go any farther. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, let's talk about something else that, that brings him into our present. Or Let me tell you why I've called you. So okay. I, I, I'm going to Walpole, New Hampshire next week to be interviewed by our mutual friend, Ken Burns. In fact, you and I met in the, uh, in the editing room right. in the Ken that's Burns right. world. His, that's right. That's and we, right. he was working on his Jefferson in 1996 or 97, and I met you. And we, we, right. we, he actually had to rebuke us at one point because we were being irreverent. About something, and uh, and no irreverence was permitted. At any rate, well, you got to be a star of that film. Um, I'm not sure how the hell you did it, but somehow everybody else ended up on the cutting room floor except for Clay Jenkinson. No, I don't wh- wh- which which film was this? This is the Jefferson for film. our listeners, so they know. 1998, Thomas Jefferson. It was it's, it was on PBS for you know, and but it's available, and um, I I lost a lot of friends because I was a chief historical consultant for for uh, the film and we interviewed 29 historians and uh, 26 of them ended up on the cutting room floor. And all of them thought that I was the one responsible for that. <laughs> and here's this guy Jenkinson, whom they don't even know the heck who the heck he is. And he's the star of the damn thing. Well, it's been all downhill from there, but to get ready for this interview on Benjamin Franklin, I, I picked up from my library, uh, your book, American creation triumphs, and Tragedies mm. in the Founding of the Republic. I think it was published in 2007, the paperback in 2008. I love this book, and and here's why I want to talk with you today, Joe. In the beginning of it, mm. you say that the founding generation um, accomplished five things, and I want to go through them one by one and ask you to... Um, to assess where we are and to, and to, and to mm-hmm. looking back at this from what, 11 or 12 years later to, 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 um, to sort of analyze how, how you're thinking about these things now. So let me just quickly go through them. First, you say it was the first successful war for colonial independence in the modern era against all the odds against the most powerful army and the most powerful Navy in the world. Second, mm-hmm. that the founders established a, the first nation sized Republic um, and they put all coercive forms of political authority on permanent defensive. Third, that this was the first wholly secular state. Until then, it was assumed that religious convictions and state religion were aligned. Um, fourth, they broke the tradition that sovereignty is single and must be uh, located in a single person or a single body. And fifth, uh, they created political parties as institutionalized channels for an ongoing dialogue, proving that dissent in a republic is not a treasonable act. So those are the five claims you made in that book. They um, still sound pretty good to me. <laughs> they sound good to me too. And, and, and so I know your most recent book, American Dialogue, sort of touched on how things look now from the perspective of the great vision of the founders, right? That's true. So I want to go through these with you. So first that this was the first successful war for colonial independence in the modern era against almost impossible odds. 
Uh, you hold to that view. Yes and no. Yes, in the sense that it literally w- appeared to be the case that the American Army, the Continental Army a group of amateurs, had no chance against the, the professional army and navy of, of Britain. And if you think about it, how many wars did Britain lose between, say, 1700 and 1945? <laughs> um, one. And this um, was it. This was it. And um, on the other hand, I've become more aware over the last 10 or 15 years in writing other things that you could look at it from the British point of view. And, and if you see Britain through the lens of, say, the Vietnam War, they had the same dilemma in North America, uh, that same kind of dilemma that we faced in Southeast Asia. They didn't, it, you know, they were fighting an insurrection. And they simply lacked the military capacity to subjugate the entire American population. They could win battles, but they couldn't subjugate the the population. They they could have stayed there for 100 years and it wouldn't have made any difference. So in that sense, the war was not as the war was unwinnable for both sides in 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 some sense of that term. Well, we Uh, won by not losing. And you make the point uh, in that that first chapter that that Washington, George Washington, had to learn uh, over his his own instincts as a warrior, he had to learn that the only way he could lose the war was by trying to win it, and the only way he could win the war was by avoiding it. Washington, like a lot of other officers in both armies at the time, was an honor-driven man. Um, if you ever think about it, why do they stand up straight when they're coming, when the other side is firing at them? Why don't they just lie on the ground? Uh, because it's dishonorable. Washington had to learn the hard way. Uh, and he almost lost everything in uh, New, in Long Island and Manhattan. Because that's the subject of your other book, Summer of Revolution, yeah, yeah. which is a brilliant account of how we barely uh, slipped the noose twice, once on Long Island and once at the northern tip of Manhattan. Yeah, somebody's got to make a movie about this. You know, if you say, you know, you see a boat crossing a river in the war and it's a great moment, you think it's, it's got to be Washington crossing the Delaware. But the crossing of the East River during the Battle of Long Island in late August of 1776, if they hadn't gotten across, I don't know what would have happened because the entire army would have been captured as well as Washington. And it's hard to play out this, the, the script from there without knowing. I mean, but that, that, was, that was also a really dramatic moment. But the, So the war itself is, is a war which in the end we win by holding out. We don't really win. The British decide to give up. And it's not worth it anymore. It's and, too costly. Um, the supply lines too are too long. Uh, the, and they... and once, once the French come into the war in 1778, they've got to defend their whole empire. And the most important part of their empire isn't North America. It's the West Indies and then later India. And uh, and so um, anyway, the, I, I hold by my earlier uh, uh, claim, but I would like to be able to uh, add an asterisk at the bottom so that a modern reader might also think that it's it's even more complicated. I like that. So I'm going to just repeat it, and I have another question based on it for you. The first successful war for colonial independence in the modern era against um, almost impossible odds. So that that's a Jeffersonian point. You know how he talks about this, that you, an island can't uh, control an empire, and um, it was inevitable that we were going to win because um, we're Englishmen and we have a sense of freedom and the, the, the liberties of humankind and um, eventually that the, the British will see the light or weary of the war or just turn away in disgust. And all that proved to be the case. Um, and you say in that chapter that if the British could have figured out where to break America, wh- where was the place you put the lever? But they couldn't because it was such a splayed out Right, uh, there geography. was no single center. That's right. There was no epicenter. So it they got moving. both New York and Philadelphia. They occupied the two most important um, communities in the in the New World, and and that doesn't do it. Well, they occupied Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and Charleston. And, they, All and the that co- still major coastal that's, cities. And it didn't make any difference. War. That's right. Because you once you went inland, you were in deep doo doo. And you think about it. Every you know the Burg. The, they came up with a term during the war. The, the Americans did called Burgoyne. To be Burgoyne meant to be to capture the entire British army in Which is Saratoga, that, right? Yeah, that's what happened. And um, yes. All right. So that's your first point. And um, you know Jefferson then said that um, 
the little flame that we lit on the 4th of July was going to spread across the world and that this was a pivotal moment mm. in human history. Do you, do you still believe that? Um, yeah, I mean, I do. Um, uh, there's a version of American exceptionalism that that clearly embodies, that we've discovered the eternal principles for uh, the creation of the best kind of society. And as you know, on his deathbed, he wrote, you know, to the celebrants in Washington, D.C. on July 4th, 1826, that, you know, that he saw this spirit continuing throughout the world. It's an enlightenment idea. And that the, the, the insights that the Americans have discovered would become the liberal, what we call the liberal state, and come to dominate the entire world. I think that there was a moment in 1990 when we all thought that, or 91, when that looked like a pretty good prediction as the, the Soviet Union collapsed and we were the last power standing, that the American model had defeated the European monarchies in the 19th century. The, Japanese and German and Italian totalitarianisms, and then the Soviet totalitarianism in the 20th century. And there was, you know, we were the last men standing. And history was over. The history was over, the end of history, yeah, Fukuyama. And, um, but um, I think since then we've, we've made, we've come to the realization that the world is a, is a complicated, the whole, type, the whole type phrase world government is crazy. There's no such thing, and world order. But I think that there's another version of American exceptionalism that both Adams and Washington had, and Adams used to debate it with Jefferson. Let's, let's take a break. we got to take a quick break, Joe, but when we come back, I want you to talk further about that. You're listening to a very special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour with Joseph Ellis, the great historian of the early national period, my favorite of all of these historians, and we're talking about his book, American Creation. We'll be back with the Thomas Jefferson Hour in just a moment. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. This week we're so pleased to uh, have a, a good friend of the Jefferson Hour, if I may call you that, sir, Mr. Joseph Ellis, back to talk with us. And when we took our break, you were talking, I, I believe, about American exceptionalism, but something you said in the first part of our conversation, you referenced uh, the fact that somebody should make a movie out of this. And <laughs> when, when we talked the other day, you sort of alluded to that. Can you ex expand on that a bit? If the movie should be called the second, the other great escape, you know, the movie, the, the great escape. And it's the escape of the Continental Army off Long Island into Manhattan. They get across the East River at night. It's a miracle. Everything has to work. Well, but, we'll, uh, we'll watch for that. Meanwhile. But watch for it. Yes. Yeah. Meanwhile, let's uh, go uh, back to Clay with uh, his John second Adams, question. Uh, John Adams' variation on yeah, American exceptionalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. American exceptionalism in Jefferson's view means that this is, we are the exception to history and we, we, have, we are the shining light that city on the hill. Adams thought that the, and so did Washington, that the origins of America were unique and exceptional, but precisely for those reasons, namely we had this huge area of land to the West. There was a huge trust fund and we were separated from Europe by the Atlantic these were natural advantages that very few other emerging nations would have. And therefore, we shouldn't expect other countries to be able to duplicate our success. Adam said to Jefferson, don't think the French are going to be able to do what we do with their revolution. It's not going to work for them. So that we should, instead of thinking of exceptionalism as the reason why it is a global model, don't think it's going to work as easily in other places. Yeah, plus Adam's view was that human nature is human nature and it, and it doesn't necessarily get better by jumping the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> That's right. I mean, human nature didn't go through any kind of transformation when they when they came over here. They were just as deprived as they are, just as well, Hobbesian in his terms. But of course, that would, uh, that would be very unwelcome news to the more utopian Thomas oh, Jefferson yeah. of Virginia. Your second point. Yeah. They established the first nation-sized republic and, and thus put all forms of political 
uh, authoritarianism on permanent defensive. So as you know, Joe, uh, the orthodoxy in Montesquieu um, was that a republic had to be a small little thing, uh, the size right. of a city state, or you know maybe right. maybe Rhode Island, but that a that a gigantic republic was simply a contradiction in terms. And Jefferson and right. Madison wrestled with this and worried it to death, and decided that if you you could have any size uh, country as long as you divided and subdivided it into more manageable units, and you you know that whole assessment um, that they did. My question is this: How well are we doing? Are we, in any meaningful sense, a republic in 2019? Oh boy! Um, um, of course, you will get different answers to that question, and um, and I think it's a question that more Americans need to argue about and think about. And uh, it's one of the things I was writing about in the book American Dialogue. Remember, the republic we were in 1789 with the Constitution was a republic of about a little less than 4 million people. We're what, 340 million now. Now, the the Madisonian, Jeffersonian idea that you mentioned earlier, which is a refutation of Montesquieu. Montesquieu, the great French political thinker and L'Esprit de Loi, 1748. The Spirit of the Laws, 1748. The Spirit of the Laws says you can't have a big republic. And I can imagine some people now saying, in the end, Montesquieu's right that um, that we're... Urban versus rural. Urban versus rural, uh, that our differences are more important than our similarities. And that it's it's simply too big to, to cohere in a pivotal point. That's to, right. Yeah. It's just it just too big, um, and um, and that and too too diverse, um, and that you know, like if you're looking to to set up a healthcare system, then that, that that's a collective system. It don't it won't work easily here because unlike other let's say Japan or uh, Britain, um, you know, you've got such di- racial and ethnic diversity that. People don't want to pay for other people who are not, quote, like me. That's just one example. But I am an optimist on this in the sense that the the divisiveness that we see around us now and we're all trying to straddle and and talk across uh, is a real thing. I think we still will. And we this the pattern is we come together in a crisis. Uh, it's it's a ominous way to think about it, but I think that climate change is going to become the defining uh, challenge and national security threat of, of our time and our children's and grandchildren's time, and we'll be forced, forced to come together collectively. But Joe, if Jefferson were in this conversation, I feel certain he would say, of course you aren't a republic. Uh, you have there's much too there, you have luxury. You have much too much money. There's too much power. <laughs> you, you're a world military uh, empire. You, you police uh, the sea lanes of the world. You don't have farmer citizens. I mean, it, from the point of view of an 18th century classical small r republican ideal, nobody could call this a republic, could they? Jefferson would think what you said, obviously, Clay, as usual, is right on about Jefferson's way of thinking. But what Jefferson then said was, these are my values. Once America ceases becoming, since it ceases being an agrarian rural society, becomes um, an urban and what we would now call industrial and post-industrial society, all the values I hold dear no longer are relevant. They're gone. They're gone. Um, And that means that his way of describing what a republic should be and the values underlying it are gone. I mean, and the attitude towards government that he brings, namely that the less government, the better that government is best, which governs least, um, that that changes. And that you see the shift there happening just at the moment you'd expect in the late 19th, early 20th century. Between 17, I mean, 1890, 1920, we go from an agrarian to an urban society and from a, um, a late agrarian to an early industrial society. And um, that's exactly so he's absolutely right on target. I mean, he doesn't know when it's going to happen. He's, he just says, I hope it does not occur in my lifetime. Well, he lived through that. We're talking about Joseph Ellis, American Creation Triumphs and Tragedies in the Founding of the Republic. David. In your book, um, American Dialogue, you, you sort of uh, – addressed Clay's question about are we still a republic. You said that that Jefferson 
always assumed that the American Revolution was more than a political movement and that each former colony would become a state-based laboratory for the establishment of uh, Republican principles. And that proves true. I mean, say March, I mean, the most important thing he ever wrote, apart from the Declaration, is the, uh, the guidelines for the Ordinance of 1784, because it meant that each incoming territory would never become a colony and uh, would be admitted as a full member into the union. And that was really a big deal. Uh, he also wanted it this at, at that moment in his life. He wanted it to be a place where slavery was prohibited. And that was in all the incoming states. If he had gotten it missed by one vote in 17, he, what did he say, Clay? He said something like, you know, the, the heaven, world heaven was, was silent in that awful moment. And now millions of unborn will be enslaved through no fault of their own for the lack of one vote in the Congress of the United States. There you go. You paint Jefferson as really forward looking at how he, um, he, he recognized that this was a political transition and it was part of what you call a larger shift in the global templates from a, mm. from a medieval to a modern society. You give him a lot of credit. Absolutely. I mean, his you know, his model was an Enlightenment model, the Plato model. He said, you, we, we are the ones, the first nation that's come out of the cave. Everybody else is back in the dark ages, and we've stepped forward. And And there's an enormously powerful idea there Though there is in Jefferson's um, formulation of this a kind of view that that means we don't have to do anything. I mean, it's a self-enabling We've vision. already done it. Now it just spreads. Yeah, it just spreads. You just let it spread. You don't have to control anything. In fact, you shouldn't because we shouldn't meddle in the sovereignties of other places. But our idea is so potent, so liberating, so magnificent, so utopian, so fulfilling right. of all the dreams of humankind that it will automatically become an addiction to everybody else. You got it. I mean, he wouldn't favor, you know, sending armies over to subjugate or to, to, you know, to protect the human rights of, say, Syrians or anything, because he say, you know, that will happen naturally. They'll just want to be like us. They'll want to yeah, be like you us. Can't, the Republican values cannot be imposed. They, 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 they have to happen. That's that's why he he sort of um, uh, disappointed Lafayette and the French moderates when he said, "Oh, don't don't push too hard here for an American style system. This is going to be a long evolutionary path for you." Mm, mm. So, Joe, the second part of that question, the second part of your thesis is that this thing that we did, this nation-sized republic, uh, put all authoritarian and despotic systems on notice. Mm -hmm. And of course that's true, but how's that holding up in the 21st century? I was just in France. They don't look on us as the beacon of light anymore. They look on us as the beacon of stuff, the beacon of pop culture, the beacon of Hollywood, the beacon of Madison Avenue, the beacon of, of creative culture, but they don't any longer see us in anything except a, uh, an ambivalent manner in terms of what we represent in, in Lockean terms about human aspiration. They, they see us as a big, powerful, bullying nation that's making terrible mistakes in the world's arena. Uh, yeah, and there's some truth in what they say. And um, I think there is a big question mark. And the, At some point in the 19th, early 19th century, what the founders call the re republicanism becomes democracy. Um, and, um, and democracy, uh, republicanism is, uh, is the a republic is based on a democratic foundation, but popular opinion is filtered through layers of refinement, um, in the Congress and the Senate and the presidency and the court. I think what is happening here is that we're seeing that democracies are vulnerable to demagogues. <laughs> the founders really knew that too, and Jefferson was well read in, in Tacitus and Thucydides in this regard, um, because popular opinion is is uh, vulnerable. And uh, now Jefferson didn't worry about it nearly as much as a guy like Adams did. Okay, and Jefferson at times would talk as if you know an ordinary farmer could you know be more likely to reach the right decision about a political question as the best read uh, person in Europe. A plowman and a professor, you know that statement where he says the plowman is going to get it right nine times out of ten. The professor That's from right. time to time. That's right. That's right. Well, I think that what we're seeing is that 
that, that, that in, in Europe and in the United States and, and um, Turkey and uh, certainly in Russia, that the, um, the, the argument can be made that they are societies that know how to do things. I mean, that, or that in order to do things, let's take China. You know, they can build a railroad all the way across China. We can't even build one from New York to Washington. Um, and we used to be able to do that. I mean, you know, the Panama Canal, the Transatlantic Railroad, the Coolidge Dam, the, the Hoover Dam, uh, the interstate highway system. Um, uh, we're no longer, at least for the moment, capable of performing major national public projects. And um and because of the divided nature of popular opinion and the political partisanship that exists in Washington um, and the plutocratic nature of government, um, we're temporarily paralyzed. And um, I just don't think that long stand that the judgments about America's role in the world and of its capacity to, to continue to be a, a flourishing republic that is a major force in the world, that those judgments should not be made at this most depressing moment. I think we're not dead yet. <laughs> Joe, you write that in the present, we are inescapably shaped by our location in a divided America mm. that is currently incapable of sustained argument and unsure of its destiny. You know, I read that, and if, if I was the plowman, I would say, well, we, uh, we don't have leadership to take us there. Mm. That's true. I mean, yeah, I mean, and I went on a book tour with that book and went to about 27 cities. And one of the things I discovered is, I mean, I didn't, I, I was, my thesis was confirmed because boy, you can't get people to argue intelligently or at all. And, um, and um, uh, I mean, and the audience in, in New York and DC is quite different from the audience in say San Antonio. Um, but that, uh, people are in their apps. I, I, I mean, it would be interesting what Clay would say about this. I don't know what Jefferson would think about the internet. Um, I mean, in some sense, it would be a, a device or a, a, a technology that he would find fascinating, to be sure. But that one of the consequences of it, I don't want to blame everything on it, but is that um, the populace is uh, occupying bubbles and they're reconfirmed in their prejudice. They are watching their, you know, MSNBC on the left or CNN, and then um, Fox News on the right. And um, uh, it's very difficult to get people to argue. And um, and and the one thing they all—that's the defining feature of the founding era. They knew how to argue with each other. Uh, the picture of the founding is a collective. And. Um, Anyway, so um, Joe, back to back to this question. So we maybe we were never quite the beacon of human idealism that we thought we were. After all, we disenfranchised women and um, Native Americans we take, were being we, shoved yeah, out of the way and slavery, right. and we, and it was a right. class system and so on. But we take their point. Do you? I think either whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, you want America to be a beacon of light in the world. Right. What Adams would say, would oh, come on, right? But um, the Adams would say it's too late. But do you, as a historian who spent your life looking at these things, think that we can recover that role in the world's arena sometime in the 21st century? Or is that just over now? No, it's it's unquestionably going to happen. We will recover. Absolutely. How will we recover, my friend? Uh, because we'll have to. Because the world's going to need a leader to move through global warming, because um, ultimately Jefferson's right that totalitarian systems are self-destructing, that our current um, par paralysis and dysfunction is temporary. It's rooted in particular personalities and particular party leaders, particular kind of that, that are soluble. Um, we're too big. We're too powerful. We occupy the most, the richest continent in the world. The only place with unique access to both the Atlantic and the Pacific, the greatest technology, the most powerful research institutions in the world. Um, and in the end, those forces will come into play. 
we do lack leadership at the political level. And in some ways, I think that we should look for great leadership now outside the political system, um, not inside it. But it's there. It's coming. So I have little faith in the current Congress. I have little faith in either of the two political parties. But I have great faith in the resourcefulness of this particular nation state. A wonderful thing that you've just said. American creation triumphs and tragedies in the founding of the republic. Let me go on to number three. You're listening to a special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. We're talking with Dr. Joseph Ellis. Joe, uh, the third point was this was the world's first wholly secular uh, uh, state that until yeah. then uh, there were uh, it was routinely understood that religion was an important part of statecraft and that uh, human nature could not be allowed to uh, to free itself from the this restraining is the mechanism. most Jefferson yeah you know, this of all the ideas this is the most Jefferson this was his greatest hit right that's right absolutely I mean it comes from the you know the the thing he uh, led and I think Madison actually wrote it the Virginia resolution on Religious freedom. 1786 and, um, passed with Madison's a great uh, floor right. leadership, while Jefferson right. was, of course, in the salons of Paris as usual. <laughs> Jefferson had the had the ability to start something, to send up a trial balloon, and then let uh, Madison the handle Madison, the, the, the grubby the, business of politics. Yeah. We're, t- we're going to take a short break here, Joe. And when we come back, I want to ask you about that. How? And the question I'm going to ask you in, in in a minute here is, how well are we doing in maintaining the wall of separation? between church and state as the 21st century unfolds. You're listening to a special edition with Dr. Joseph Ellis of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back. Joseph Ellis, uh, tell us where you think we are on your third point of a wholly secular state. Well, I think that nobody's challenged that basic principle in the courts and tried to reverse revise it. it's in the first amendment of the bill of rights but i think we're still okay i mean i still think we remain a predominantly secular society in the sense that the government is not permitted to endorse any particular religion or denomination and that when that goes too far the courts correct so i'm not pessimistic me either, you know, and, and, and I'm, I'm with you that this is Jefferson's greatest achievement, and he and Madison felt a particular passion for this principle, and Jefferson, of course, gave us the phrase, a wall of separation between church and state in his letter Yeah, to I the think Danbury history's Baptist. proven Jefferson right, though, because the, when he was saying this and when we were doing this for the first time, everybody in the world said, you can't do that, it won't work, They'll, people will just end up killing each other because they're too diverse and they hold it to be... And, well, 200 and some years later, we're fine. I mean, it works. And, and people want to come to this country precisely because that principle remains intact. Muslims of the world come here to be to be allowed to practice their faith, for God's sake. I agree. And, and even though there's some porousness um, at the local level where there's maybe some prayer in, in, at a public event and there's a creche maybe on a courthouse lawn or a cross on, on a public mountain— when push comes to shove, when these things rise to the level of the federal court system, the courts almost invariably side with Jefferson on this. That's right. And there's there's a broad consensus among the American people that even if, if this feels a little intrusive at times, that this is a very important wall of separation. I am pleasantly surprised at the optimism that both of you gentlemen are exhibiting for our this our happy republic, and it it brings me back to a, a, a James Parton, a quote that I know you've written, and oh. <laughs> it is, "If Jefferson was wrong, America is wrong. If Jefferson was right, America is right." Ah, uh, but Joe, I, I think you're revising that. The last time we had you on, you were pretty dark about Mr. Jefferson. I think you think Jefferson was wrong on some really, really, really fundamental questions like race, I do. slavery, I do. Uh, and gender. Yeah. I mean, we we've been th- th- there are many Jeffersons, and um, and he's one of the most multifaceted figures in American history. And if you want to talk about uh, religion, religious freedom, boy, he is going to be a, a star in the story. If you want to talk about race, he's not your best suit. He's not gonna, he's not gonna be somebody you like, and um, and that's you know the original sin in American history, and um, he's not gonna be good on that, and that you know remains a real problem. I'm I'm not you know, and so none of my cocktail party friends over here in Amherst, uh, Massachusetts, regard me as a as a 
uh, as an optimist. I mean, and uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm I'm a an ironist, I guess, but I'm not I'm I'm not a dystopian. I'm, I'm I think I'm reacting against what else I see as a kind of dystopian trend in American thinking and in American public culture, and that's crazy too. It's shallow. You don't know enough to be unhappy. Um, you know, you really want to understand the tragedy, um, you know, and, and so that especially among some younger people, um, Try Haiti, sort of walk, you know, yeah, uh, Iran, you haven't earned the right to be pessimist or, you know, and, <laughs> um, and um, uh, so I'm fighting against them in something. I'm like Adams. I'm, you know, in that sense, I'm a contrarian. And um, but I mean, if you want to have if if you want to to talk about the future of America, you always want to have Jefferson on your side. Yeah, you wrote, if Jefferson was flawed, America is flawed, and if America seeks to face its flaws, Jefferson is the man we most need to understand. That's right. That's right. And understand him for his flaws as well as for his greatness. And uh, But as you know, Joe, when you started out a number of decades ago, Jefferson was still riding high, and he was seen as a, quote, accidental slaveholder. That's gone <laughs> and gone forever. Yes, it is. It is. And I'm partially responsible for that. And um, but I still think, you know, I have red hair and I went to William and Mary. What more can I tell you? <laughs> so your fourth point is that the American founders broke the tradition that sovereignty was singular and indivisible and, of course, created our marvelous federalist system in which there is some sovereignty in the nation state and yet there is sovereignty in the 50 individual states and so on. How's that holding up, the, the the idea of a divided sovereignty? It was holding up really well, I mean, until fairly recently, I think. And uh, as one of the key branches, the Congress has surrendered much of its authority, especially in foreign policy, to the executive branch. And I think that the Constitution is getting unbalanced, and I'm concerned that the current re occupant of the White House is making the claim that he, as president, is above the law. And um, that... That is a very troubling suggestion. And um, what's more troubling is that about 40 million people seem to think that's okay, Joe. I think that the, the support that President Trump enjoys among uh, a distinctly uh, powerful group of a moderate minority of Americans should not be read as an endorsement of the principle that the presidency is an office that stands above the law. And to the extent that he becomes identified with that position, his support will significantly decline. But, you know, it's not just Donald Trump. Um, he may be an extreme and demagogic form of that uh, mm -hmm. view, but mm -hmm. but, he, but the idea of, a, of an exceedingly strong executive has been growing for a long time, as you know. And so G.W. Bush had people in his Justice Department who talked about a unitary executive. Right. Uh, we, the, the, we need to kill that idea. I mean, that, that's, a, that's that, you know, Justice Department memo too, and right. I believe that, that certain people, like the current Secretary uh, Attorney General and uh, the most recent uh, appointee to the Supreme Court, all endorse that. Um, it's a super right-wing view that uh, I think you've brought before the court will be found to be unconstitutional, and um, I think that it's 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 it in, it's endorsed by people who. Um, strangely wish to weaken the federal government by strengthening the executive branch and um, weakening the Congress, I guess. But on the other side, Joe, you know, when Barack Obama was president, he filled the vacuum by uh, working heavily with executive orders. And we know that's not, you know, that's that's a quasi semi unitary presidency. So we've got a systemic problem. And, and here's where Jefferson he comes in. Jefferson would say, tear up the darn thing and reformulate it so that it can actually cover the exigencies of the 21st century when you need a stronger executive right. than the founders could have contemplated, but you don't want him to be an absolutist. Isn't that Jefferson's point? Well, that's a, the that's even a modest expression of Jefferson's point. Jefferson wanted us to redo the Constitution every 21 years. Jefferson <laughs> wanted every generation to be sovereign. You know this, Clay. Right, and so I if mean, we did it's that, one we would address— crazy, it's, it's one of his crazier ideas. You can imagine when he writes this to Madison in 1789, Madison just spent a year trying to make— this thing called the Constitution work for a period, a good period of time. And Jefferson says, we just throw it away after 21 years. I mean, I think that the, that it's a, it's an idea which is impractical in the extreme and would lead to anarchy. 
but I think that it holds a kernel of, of insight and truth in, in it, in it, Jefferson's idea. Now, if you said, okay, well, the, the real meaning of Jefferson's idea is that there's so many things that we need to change in the current constitution. Clearly, we need to get rid of the electoral college. And, uh, um, and um, for example, that's one thing. And, um, but that if you tried to have a second constitutional convention in 2019, 2020, it would be impossible. It would be a lab. I mean, I mean, it's it, you know it, it, the reason that the Constitution worked as well as it did is because 55 white guys could get together. Nobody was even allowed to know what they were talking about, and to do this in secrecy. Uh, and then just this, you know, send it forward. It would violate all our roots, rules of diversity, inclusiveness, transparency, if we were to have another convention. And and for that reason, it we would just be a circus. I see Steve Bannon as chair, Nancy Pelosi as recording <laughs> secretary. Sounds sounds perfect to me, Joe. But, well, yeah. but good luck. <laughs> but do you feel that the that the laboratory of democracy? idea that the state federalism um you know state sovereignty federal sovereignty that they that's a it's a careful ballet in which things move a little but basically it holds up do you think that that principle is still effective i think it needs to be fixed in some substantial it's like the engine needs to be overhauled it can't be replaced because we don't have the parts to do it um, but it needs to be overhauled uh, in a significant way. And um, I mean, and uh, I mean, uh, the end of the Electoral College is one such thing. I mean, we need to do away with the filibuster. We need, I think, to have term limits. Um, we need to find ways to keep money out of government. Life tenure what, on the courts. Well, I mean, yeah, that's a question I think that, that needs to be at least looked at. I mean, and um, that there, there are a lot of things, you know, every, every person who runs for a national office would have to declare his or her um, tax returns for the last 10 years and um, put their state in, 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 in a real trust. trust. So yeah, let me ask the yeah. last question. We're almost out of time. Your fifth one that we've been, David Swenson said we were, were surprisingly cheerful and optimistic. I think this is well, where I think things you are. Actually. I think this is where it starts to break <laughs> down, Joe. Your fifth principle is that the founders created sort of without intending to um, a two party political system, which has institutionalized and channelized the ongoing debate about the meaning of America. Um, from what you've already said, and from what one observes, it appears that 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 thing is not doing well. That is absolutely correct, and that's it's not serving the, the original intent it uh, was supposed to serve, to provide a balanced debate and a, a framework for ongoing debate uh, about the. That's what the Constitution is. It's a framework for a con. It's not a set of solutions. It's a framework for a set of arguments. Um, and the political parties have come into existence. The founders, including Jefferson, hated them. I mean, you will know this quote, Jay. You know, if I must go to heaven and with a party, I prefer not to go. I'd at rather all. not go uh, at all. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so, yet he founds the first opposition. Well, party. Madison did. Jefferson was well, just standing around. Oh, he's the generalissimo, and and, <laughs> and Madison is the general, and um. Um, yeah, you're right. He's done it much, but that yes, the political parties are not functioning as they intend as the, as were intended. Um, they become the prisoners of money, um, and uh, I think that uh, we're in a second gilded age. Uh, uh, we are a plutocracy. Um, the middle class that should be the controlling factor in elections has been not, if not killed, put on life support. Um, and this is bad. Um, uh, it's, it's, but it's, you know, the institutions still have the, res, res, what's the word I'm looking for? Resilience and right. the, the reservoir of history on their side. And if you trust them, they will eventually, I mean, they're not going to change of their own. They're, they're, they're going to have to be changed from forces outside them in the way the abolitionists changed the slavery issue. Um, but I, but we've got the basic stuff here, okay, as well as a continent, uh, as well as a divi almost divinely inspired location. 
Um, we've got the makings. They, I still think um, if they were here, they would, you know, they would be upset with all kinds of things we're doing. And, um, but um, there, where Jefferson still lives is in the optimism that you're hearing in my voice now. It's so good to hear it. You know, two things about that, though, before we, we close. One is that in the last great um, impeachment crisis we had, the Nixon um, uh, situation, uh, two things. One, well, there is was the, one in there they called the Clinton end one too. Well, go ahead. And, yeah. and there was also the Iran Contra thing. But, but, but yeah. going to, going to Watergate for a moment. Two things. One is when the Supreme Court voted eight to zero that he should turn over the tapes. He did. Uh, that's right. uh, that means that the rule of law, that the basic respect for our constitutional system, was somewhere at the heart of Richard Nixon's soul, even though he had done a lot of re- ridiculous and and illegal stuff. Closer to Richard, the surface. Nixon, whatever you say about him, he cared about the country as well as about himself. That's he one did. thing. The second thing is that the the party system was in less bad shape then, and so even though the Republicans clung to Nixon as long as they dared, they knew that he was a schnook, and eventually Goldwater got into that taxi and went over to the White House and said, it's over, Dick. Right. Uh, I think that our, our broken two-party system now is going to be, we're for him and we're against him, and it doesn't get much more sophisticated than that. You very probably are right. I would predict that, that, the, that the president is impeached in the House and is not found guilty in the Senate. Um, a lot will depend on the evidence that comes forward in ensuing weeks and the public testimony and the unforeseen things. I mean, a month ago, nobody had heard about Ukraine. And um, uh, I do think the likelihood is that um, that they will not reach the two-thirds majority necessary. But if, in fact, it's a majority vote in the Senate, even though not a two-thirds majority, I think that serves its purpose. Um, it seriously wounds and censors the uh, Mr. Trump. I share your view. One last very, very simple question. Joseph Ellis, um, our favorite uh, historian, will um, Donald Trump be the next president of the United States? No. You've been listening to this very interesting special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. David, wasn't this cool? It, always great to talk to you, Joe. Thanks so much. Hey, David, thanks for having me. You got you got a, you got a good partner there. He has he, he knows something about Jefferson. You know that? Yeah, you know, you'll notice how quiet I am. <laughs> so, Joe, you got to come back. So I want you to come back in a short time, maybe in a few weeks, and talk about what we should do to fix the United States Constitution, what changes we would make and why. All right. I'm doing a thing in Washington in a couple of weeks with federal judges on that topic. So, yes, I'd love to. And, uh, uh, Clay, I, I, they are going to make this movie. If they're looking for somebody to play Jefferson, I'm in. I get, <laughs> if, all right, if you'll I'll, be Adams, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not going to play any role. I mean, you're going to be Adams. I'll be Jefferson. We'll have Ken Burns as Madison. No, none of us can act. <laughs> Thank you, sir. So good to talk with you. Bye bye. I so enjoy listening to the two of you exchange ideas on Jefferson. Every time I pick up his books, I just think. Thank goodness such a historian exists because he's not a, a like a straight academic where he writes prose that nobody oh, wants to read. He's great fun to read. He's he, great he has fun. a beautiful prose style, very but accessible, he is... and he has a sense of humor, which you hear, of course, in the in the exchange between us. But he has a unique historical irreverence and sense of humor. I think he said he's an ironist. You know, irony is his way, <laughs> his right. lens on the Somewhere world. Somewhere he said that, yeah. Uh, and he has such a depth of knowledge, and he's, he, like you, is able to just reach in and grab these things and, and then sort of mold them into understandable theories and facts. If I could be Joseph Ellis, I would. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I would. One last time, our special thanks to Dr. Joseph Ellis for being on the show this week. Go to jeffersonhour.com. You can find out more about the show, about Professor Ellis and his books. And we have an announcement, something new. Yes, um, we have a new hotline, a the hotline. Jefferson Hour hotline. Uh-huh, uh-huh. You can call in your questions or comments. Call this number, 701-575-575. 0727. Yes, you can leave questions for Clay Jenkinson, comments about the show, or a question for President Jefferson. That number one more time. 701-575-0727. Call us and get your voice on the Jefferson Hour. And until next week, thank you for listening.
The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701-575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program, Through the Eyes of Thomas Jefferson.